welcome everyone and um, give you a couple of seconds background about me. I'm a professor at Southern College of Optometry. I've uh, been there 50 years. Uh, emphasis throughout the whole time has been uh, on uh, children and since 1998, even younger children during the first year of life when um, I became a part of the infancy program in, in developing that. I uh, did a fellowship at the Gazelle Institute of Child Development uh, a couple of years after graduation. Uh, Dr. Gazelle had already retired, but if any of you are familiar with the Ilgen Ames books, um, I worked with both of them um, on, on a daily basis, which was uh, very, very eye-opening. Uh, what I'm going to do today is, is go through some basic background uh, of, of where I'm coming from and how I look at things, and, and most of it is going to be things that everybody says, well, that makes sense, that makes sense. But to then come in and have somebody else say it, um, it confirms what you already think. So what I want to do is actually start with references first. Everybody always finishes with references, but I, I, the, the ones I'm using are so impactful. Like making eye contact is the most powerful mode of establishing a communicative link between humans. And that's from 18 years ago, but it, it's, it's so, so important uh, that, that you establish making eye contact with your child. And then gaze is accurate in order to see clearly, not because targets can be seen clearly. Now these are the titles of those, but, but gaze means looking. And we look not because we see clearly, but to be able to see it more clearly. Um, everything is not clear in early development, nor is everything clear throughout our field as adults. But we see something, we look, and that then becomes clearer. A very important one in terms of overall development, baby and adult brains sync up during play. That was something I found last year that I thought was very, very interesting. That, that the, the brain patterns in the caregiver and the baby sync up during play. And I'm sure it's to other things too, uh, but, but it's very important. And then uh, the one I found in 2018, a potential downside of high visual acuity. Um, one of the things they found was in, in kids who had cataracts removed, early cataracts removed, was that the prescription was the full prescription, yet they found that those kids, by the time they got on later in life, didn't show visual acuity as significantly increased as they did whenever they uh, didn't prescribe the full amount and got them to looking and engaging in print. I'm going to start with Gazelle, and a lot of my background comes from the teachings of Gazelle. But one of the things that he said in one of his books, which I'll give you the reference in just a second, so fundamental is the sense of vision that it's the traditional criterion of wakefulness as opposed to sleep. An infant does not really wake up until he begins to look, and when he ceases to look, he goes to sleep. Now, those of you who have babies, think about that. It, when, when, when they wake up, they start looking, and whenever they stop looking, they go to sleep. That's from 1941, a book called Developmental Diagnosis. That's, what, 60, 80 years ago almost. Uh, it's still just as true today as it was then. So those are all clear statements that, that vision has a critical importance in overall development. And I, I, I trust the process of overall development as an active process. It's not a passive process. Throughout life, and vision becomes the leader and the instigator of action. If you're going to do anything beyond your physical reach, vision has to be the leader. You have to look, gaze, uh, I call it the, the visual reach. Look, attend, focus, identify, and engage. And so you have to go through those steps. Overall theme is give your baby time and attention. 
uh, that's harder and harder to do with as, as much uh, uh, as our lives are filled with activity and appointments and games and changes. But life is happening so quickly for these babies. And by the time they get to, get to school, they've passed through many stages of development. And all of those need to have a good foundation. Each stage builds on the other. And then when there are disruptions or, or distractions uh, at any stage, and they don't get the necessary attention to provide an appropriate foundation, then all ensuing stages will, will, stages will be impacted. Now, there are pressing issues in everyday life that have certainly increased during this pandemic. Uh, life is different. And it's so important, though, to make use of the limited time you have. Uh, it, it's, it's important that you give a, a fewer quality minutes as opposed to a long time just being in the same room with your baby. So make sure that those time you, that time that you spend, those minutes that you spend are quality minutes, not uh, overall just being in the same room. Anytime you have a distraction at any stage, it only limits development during that particular stage, but it risks disrupt, disruption in ensuing stages. And what I mean by that is uh, preparing a lecture now for our academy meeting in, in uh, uh, October. And, and one of the things is they call it technoference. The technology interferes with communication with your baby, with your child with your sibling, with your spouse. This link begins minutes after birth. There are several people that report that babies mimic the, their parental expression shortly after birth. You see too many times that the babies can't see. The babies can see, they just haven't learned to look and everything is passive. They just haven't learned to look. Everything close so shows increasing familiarity is they can explore those over and over with eyes and other reaching processes. But it's something they can feel, touch, uh, along with looking. I call that the, the, the circle of understanding. Some people call it a bubble. Uh, I like that too. But that's that area around them that they can see, feel, touch, smell, and taste. But those initially are only receptive. Everything comes to them. Everything in life is handed to them or done for them because they can't do it for themselves. Through time and their own curiosity, important curiosity, they will begin to venture outside of that circle of understanding. And that so much should be understanding. Encourage visual curiosity about things further away, stimulating movement towards them. So, when I said vision becomes the instigator, I see something and I start that process of moving to get towards it. Uh, in, in one of the, the videos that we have, you can see the baby at four months of age and hands are just almost ringing while they're looking at that target. They're looking, but they don't yet have the ability to reach out and grab the target. By six months of age, not only can they look, but they can accurately reach, grab the target. So they, their small looks to movement objects and people outside the circle sets the sta that stage for development. But I, I, I liken this circle of understanding to uh, uh, the way a butterfly breaks out of their co cocoon. If you slice the cocoon, the butterfly can never fly. The butterfly in reaching out of the cocoon begins to develop the, the, the stage and the foundation necessary to be able to fly. Tummy time. Tummy time is so important in overall development. And there's a lot of people that talk about tummy time. But think about in vision development when the head is down and you get on the tummy and head starts coming up and vision starts moving out. And as they raise their head, they continue the curiosity of looking further away, again, stimulating movement to get to that. Their, their movements first are just going to be movements. They're not going to be purposeful to get to that, literally purposeful. But gradually, they'll develop a coordination of those movements, and that purpose of getting to that begins to come there into, uh, into effect. 
And as they look, their curiosity is stimulated and thus movement is stimulated to everything that's around them outside of the cocoon, outside the bubble, outside of that circle of understanding now. And it sets the stage for curiosity about all kinds of things further away. Allow them to work through turning over and moving toward the object or, or the person you or the task or wh whatever it might be. When they're turning over, there's a reason for that. It's to engage rather than just going through the act of turning over. Remember, the more you do for them, the less they're stimulated to do for themselves. So in that play, don't just do things for them. Don't just take them places. Stimulate them to, to, to do things further away. Here's an example. Gaze follow. And there's a, a researcher at the University of Washington, Andy Meltzoff, who's done a lot of work in this. He's not an optometrist, but he's done a lot of work in gaze follow. And, and what I want to do is link gaze to a, a vision to other aspects of development. What he found is when parents look at a target, the baby looks at you, sees you looking at that target about 12 months of age. And to respond to that, they respond to more words at 18 months of age when compared to those that do not follow the parent's gaze. So if you're not there helping them look and, and follow your gaze, then you're limiting their ability to even learn language. And when I say respond to words, I'm not talking about saying words. I'm just responding to what the word is. Now that difference is if they follow your gaze, 337 words they respond to by 18 months of age versus 194 words if they don't follow your gaze. So it's just so important that they, that they do that. Now, just, just look at this process of development through there. Here, here's the baby now just beginning to look and now on tummy, head up, looking already engaged in the reaching process. When they first start on tummy time, they, they don't have the controlled ability to reach yet, but now we're already reaching. And now we get to engaging further and further away, pointing, looking. Look, the lips, the eyes, the finger, the support, everything is there to say, I want that, and it's further away. That's what I mean. That captures what I mean by um, uh, vision is the leader and the instigator of things beyond themselves. What happens if that process is fully developed and, and encouraged by the caregiver? Uh, for instance, when the mouth of the speaker is not seen well, language development is compromised, and lazy eye uh, is, is a process of that amblyopia. But what about the masks now? Um, whenever you, you uh, can only hear words and you can't see my mouth, even those of you watching just the, vi the video, you can't see. But whenever I talk like this, as long as it's coordinated the same way um, and we're not losing it in the, the, the technology transmission, um, th even the mask that we're wearing now, uh, they're, they're going to be long-term effects of this pandemic. That, that might not be major, but, but they are going to be effects that are there. The looking ability is reduced and, they're reduced, and therefore understanding is not at the typical stage that it should be for his age. So what can you do as a parent? First and foremost, no devices until age two. I know that uh, a lot of people say, well, I'm in the grocery line and she's screaming and I give her the iPad and it calms everything down. And there are exceptions to every rule, but, but when you use a device as a babysitter and establish that pattern, you've established something that's way, way different. World Health Organization guidelines were published uh, just a year ago, and, and that uh, particular um, uh, guideline comes from there. And um, I'll be doing also a, a thing on um, um, digital device use in children uh, at the academy meeting. And, and I'll go through each of those. It's a much longer set from under one year, one to two years, three to five years, and, and, and above.
engage the baby about looking at them and talking to or with them. Look them in the eye. Don't be doing things and don't let it just be language. Because that just Provide unrestricted movement activities early in development. In other words, uh, carrying them in the carrier uh, is a good place to get from point A to point B. But at some point after that, they've got to be out of the carrier. I think OT, OTs call that container box syndrome. Uh, it, it's a very passive way of development. Everything is coming to them. Movement is being done for them. Uh, you want them to encourage the baby to get out of their cocoon. Uh, provide unrestricted movement activities with guidance as they develop more efficient ability to move about. So you just don't take them outside and, and set them down and think, well, now they're out. You, you've got to somehow engage with them. Begin looking with them, talking with them, possibly engage with a child, an infant, young child, with things within their surrounding. Provide toys and other safe objects outside of their circle of understanding to simulate their, stimulate their curiosity and the development of purposeful movement. I see that over there. I want to get to it. I'm going to develop my ability to get over there and get to it. But they maintain their fixation on that the entire time. Provide activities that promote linking all motor and sensory processes. Look and reach, look and touch, physically move to an object or, or, or a toy. Uh, uh, one of the things that I, I talk about is, is uh, the, the reaches. Think of it, um, let's take it out of vision right now. Think of it in terms of auditory. You hear all kinds of sounds but suddenly you begin to tune in and listen to a certain sound or particular sound. You've got a whole room in front of you of, of visual stimulation, but you choose to look at one thing, to reach with vision and look at one thing. You um, have the sense of touch, but you also begin to feel, and feeling is different than just touching. So think about all of those, link, linking all of those together. Recognize that actions such as throwing things off the high chair is a developmental activity and just engage them for a period of time. They're not trying to control you. They're trying to see what happens whenever I push it there. How long does it take it to drop? Then they look over to the side of the chair and look, and then they look at you. Get that for me, caregiver, and put it back up because I want to do that again. Um, that's not just trying to control you. That's learning to, to, to do that. Teach them to look through joint attention. They learn to read the other spaces, what they might be looking at, what they might be thinking, and even how they might be thinking about it. Remember, very first, one of the very first references, baby and parents' brains sync up during play. Um, there, there are all kinds of, teach them to follow their gaze. Following your gaze also helps them begin to think about what's interest to you and how to read your face and see if, face and eyes to see if what's interest to you. If you're looking at something, they're going to see that, they're going to look too. And now they know, oh, that's interest to mom, of interest to mom, dad, grandma, granddad, or, or whatever. Teach them to look over, under, and behind and through, through gaze following and joint attention, they learn the beginnings of laterality and directionality and up and down and side to side. They learn all of those kinds of things. Teach them to find hidden objects. Object permanence is a thing that begins around six months of age, plus or minus. But the things still exist, even though they might be covered, a phone, and now it's not gone. Early on, before that time, it's gone whenever they can't see it, and now it's there. At when object permanence comes in, they find those hidden objects because now they know it's still there. They begin to realize, too, that when you walk out the door, you're still there. Teach them to look beyond their reach. Don't just hand things to them, because as they do that, that sets the foundation and motivation which leads to crawling, walking, running, bike riding, driving. If you have a young baby, all those things are sort of scary right now. My goodness, one day they're going to be driving. But, but if you give them the good foundation, driving becomes a much better uh, uh, process for them. 
Teach them to follow and print in a book by pointing to the words as you read with them. Not to teach them words, but to begin to establish the eye, visual patterns and eye patterns necessary for, for uh, reading later on. All this involves parental, parental or caregiver engagement with a child. And so the more you can engage your child, the, the better foundation you establish for them. Uh, one of the examples I use with parents is, is the old airplane game of, of whenever you're feeding. Some people just are looking and watching at something else, and the baby notices that, so they're looking and watching to see, and you're just putting food in their mouth. Play the game. Get them to look, and now you're looking, and they know that you're engaged with them. Development doesn't happen passively. Development does not happen passively. Ensure their activities involve active use of vision to set the stages for later development. And all this involves engagement, which is a term I really like, with your infant and young child. Even in the first stages of development following birth, vision is awakened. Uh, look for patterns of looking and focus. They're, they're already developed. Uh, that, that, the, that, that slide is, is a whole lecture in itself about when people start seeing things happen. But don't underestimate the importance of your engagement with the child in any visual activity. Um, when there's a, a study that shows that between 70 minutes and seven hours, I'm sorry, 72 hours, three days, babies begin to look at you and imitate things that you do, something as simple as sticking out in the tongue whenever you stick out in your tongue, starts in that first two or three days, early, early on, but only if you stimulate. It doesn't happen passively. So what can you do again? Look at them, smile with them, point with them, pick up after they drop an object again and again. Roll a ball to them and, and, and expect them to roll it back as they begin to sit it up. Set it, sit as they begin to sit up uh, as, as a toddler. Place things out of their reach to encourage their curiosity, including to reach beside them and behind them. Uh, visually engage the baby at all stages. Don't let your own phone or tablet interfere with eye contact with your baby. I have a slide that I've staged, but it shows the dad feeding the bottle to the baby, but he's over here texting on his phone. Imagine the message the baby is getting from that. Have another one with mom holding the baby, feeding the baby here, but she's got her computer in front of her and she's engaged in, in that. Those contact times, eye contact times are so important. And the most important times are when feeding, diaper changing, things that, that, that you're gonna have to be doing something with them anyway. Remember, you are the baby's best resource during all stages of development. You're the best toy they have. Use that uh, to, to your advantage and, and use that to the baby's advantage uh, as they grow and mature. And I think that's the, the beginning of things that I want to set the stage for, for what I do. Um, and I think, Colin, you probably have um, uh, some questions either already or there we go. Yeah. You want to go ahead and stop sharing your... Stop sharing. Stop. Okay, there we go. All right. So, yeah, and just to let you know, Bubba, I think your microphone might be on your earbud thing and it's kind of rustling. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Wonderful. Yeah, I used my AirPods or on an earlier call, and uh, the quality of that's not as good as the Bose. Oh, well. Nice. <laughs> but, okay. but that's why it picks up everything. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So one question we have um, from a mother. She took her eight-month-old in to see a pediatric ophthalmologist a couple weeks ago. Um, he has a left inward turn, intermittent. Um, you can barely see it. Um, the father has amblyopia and is blind in one eye. Um, so the ophthalmologist um, prescribed glasses. 
and mom is saying it just doesn't sit right with her. She feels like it, it was a recommendation just based on family history alone. Um, but just asking generally questions, she does have a, an appointment with a vision therapy um, office this upcoming week, but she just wants to know, is she just feeling, is she just crazy for feeling uneasy or, or is there something there? Um, I learned a long time ago, moms are never crazy when they have feelings um, uh, about anything. Um, you know, and obviously, uh, all, all my response is to any parent that has a, a, a question is, is going to be very generic, uh, rather than specifically geared toward uh, your child. But I will say, history, parental history, is, is definitely one thing we look at, because that is, could be the, the, the genetic stage that's set if there's a problem. This doesn't mean there's going to be a problem. And, and I believe much beyond, um, um, much beyond uh, simple genetics. But that could be the route that a child would go. Now, there, there are a lot of things that can be done prior to... Um, prescribing glasses, unless you see that that pair of glasses makes a specific difference. And if you see that it makes a difference with and without, then, then that definitely is an indication that it's, um, it, it's an appropriate uh, treatment. Um, again, going back to what I've just gone over, I would look at the way people look at things, the way they look, how they look, how they go about looking, um, the baby, not just people, uh, but, but look at how they go about looking and where do they look and how do they look? What's the difference between when you look at things close and they look at things farther away? Um, and, and then what's the difference in the way they look at things, particularly up close, if it's an inward eye turn, with the glasses and without the glasses? Um, I usually um, wait unless it's just a, a, a very dramatic response. I wait and initiate guidance activities um, prior to using glasses in those very early stages. Uh, but sometimes you have to. Sometimes you have to use glasses. But, but I want to establish the looking process first. Okay. Now, to specifically answer the question, there are any number of things that can be used. Vision therapy can be one. Guidance activities can be one. Glasses can be one. Any of those things in combination uh, would be an appropriate kind of thing. Um, can you elaborate on what guidance activities might be? Guidance activities, uh, I call one of them. I call eye stretches, and it's it's to just get the the child to looking out here. For instance, my hand is out here and get them to looking there, leading with eyes to look. Simple kinds of things. Uh, look, whenever you have them down, if they if they're, can get down on their tummy and they begin to look up, reach for things to the left side, reach for things to the right side, leading with the, towards the right, making sure the right eye is leading towards the right. And if you cover an eye, let me see if I can get up there. If you cover an eye, left eye looking to the left and right eye looking to the right, um, reaching and touching the thing. And since I'm trying to look at the screen, it's obvious that I missed. And so now when I look, it's, it's much more accurate. I look at the screen again and I'm in front of it. So, um, so you know, get an accuracy in looking as they're, they're doing those kinds of things. But just based on that foundation, a guidance activity is look and engage with your child whenever you're changing diaper. Uh, look and engage with your child when you're feeding. Um, look and engage with your child uh, when you're doing all kinds of activities. That's what I mean by guidance. It, it's not as, as direct um, and, and not as sophisticated as an actual vision therapy program but it's something you can do throughout the course of a day over and over and over again, rather than once a week for 
15 minutes. I, I don't even recommend parents do that for 15 minutes at a time because what are you going to have with a seven-month-old? you you got uh, 15 seconds of them looking, and if I say do it 15 minutes, 14 minutes and 45 seconds of fighting to get them to do it. You don't want to encourage a fight with parents. But if you can do that four, five, six times a day for 15 seconds, that's something I can't do in the office. That's something you as a parent can do. Okay. We have another question from a parent here. My four-year-old could only see about 2040-ish at distance at the pediatrician's office. Should I be concerned about this? She won't let me near her to examine her. Her near vision seems unaffected. I, her mother, am a high minus first pair of glasses in first grade. Uh, again, we, we've got a family history. Uh, so it's definitely something you want to begin looking at earlier and earlier and earlier. Family history doesn't dictate how the child is going to go, but family, you, you, that always is, a, is a, 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 an issue. 2040 at four years of age, mm, not particularly a major issue. It depends on how they do it. And most of the time at, at uh, care, medical caregivers' offices, it's can they see a certain um, picture or letter, generally pictures at that age, on a screen at a certain distance away. Um, but in, to any parent who asks a question, well, and this is a, seems to be a problem, I'll say, first thing you need to do, is schedule an exam and make sure that it's that it either either is not a problem or it is a problem that needs to be addressed. Um, and 2040 is one of those cutoff times where at four years of age I'm not particularly worried um, as long as I do the exam and everything checks out. And who would she schedule an appointment with and how is that different than what was done at the pediatrician's office? Uh, the pediatrician just a, a, a basic screening and, and it's very superficial. Um, I'm, I'm very biased and so you'll hear my bias come through, but I think it needs to be an optometrist, an optometrist who works with children and, uh, and an optometrist, it, it can be your local optometrist and, and they can work with children. It doesn't have to be a specialist. Um, but that's, that's your first step. And your local optometrist will find out if it's a problem, will give you some guidance. If it is a problem, is it more of a problem than, than they can manage, then they'll coordinate a consult with you. But start local. Great. Okay, another question we have. At what age should convergence be apparent? Is it possible that babies are not converging enough because they are not using open cups so they can see the flow of liquid and movement together? Why do you think it's a growing problem for kids? Um, I don't know the, the background to that, but um, to, to converge to a cup and watch that is, is hard for almost any age person. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily want them to look in the cup and, and follow that, uh, and, and especially babies and, and toddlers. Now, when, you, when I think of convergence, I'm thinking of, are they able to look at a target that, that I'm holding in my hand that, that's um, a reasonable distance away, not something that's, that's right up here. Um, recall a patient one time where they were told by the medical caregiver um, and um, another doctor that they had an eye turn. And my question was, well, when do you see it? And said, oh, well, every time I hold it right up here. And I'm talking about this close. So when I hold it that close, well, you may see an eye turn, but what happens out at a more reasonable distance? Um, so um, what I, what I would, would want to know is, do they hold things and look at them at a reasonable distance? Be very careful about at such an early age looking at the cup, because my goal at that point in time is to want babies to begin to go outside rather than come towards them. 
and reinforce something that might not be good. Okay. And just clarifying, what age should convergence be apparent? Um, you may see convergent at, at just a few weeks on a, on a temporary basis. Um, it, it's whatever they choose to focus on. And, you know, if you breastfeed or bottle feed, um, those things are very close and they learn to focus on those kinds of things. But also I want them to learn to look away while they're doing that. All right, we have another question here. And, and, and one, one oh. more thing. That increases in sophistication as they grow and develop. Okay. Okay, another question here. Um, my daughter is nearly one and desperate to walk. Um, it says that she has intermittent exotropia. Um, she's cruising. Um, mom says she feels like she's not using her vision to see where to go. Um, and how can she help her? Well, first thing, if you're seeing an exotropia, we need to start with the exam. Uh, we, we don't want to, uh, to let something else go that we might think it's, it's something simple like, like that, like not using both eyes together when in fact it, it, it might be something much, an underlying cause that's much more significant than that. So that's my first recommendation, get the examination. Um, don't just start doing some things because, well, this is what somebody said. Um, what happens whenever the baby is on the back? And that's one of the things that I want, want, would want to know. What happens whenever you turn the baby on the back and when do, how do they look? When do they use both eyes together? Begin some of these reaching activities, guidance activities. Do they, do they reach all the way with the right eye to the right side and the left eye to the left side? And do they look and can they touch and can they reach? If they're, if they're one year old, they should be reaching accurately. Is their reach accurate? is the reach accurate to the right side versus the left side. But what I also want to do is as I, um, as, as I look, one of the tools that I will use is called a retinoscope. And that gives me an accurate idea, not a refractive power, which is the old use for a retinoscope. It's how well and how accurate are they at, at reaching for that, visually reaching for that target that's right in front of them? And are both eyes working together in doing that? Um, find a distance where um, once, once you've established there's no significant underlying cause, find a distance where they might use both eyes together and then begin to go from there. But let the doctor guide you because you've already got an eye turn um, and we, we need more than just doing some basic activities to get that squared away. Okay, we've got another question sent in here. Our son is 14 years old with two strabismus surgeries at four years and six years of age. He wears glasses, one and 3.5 diopters. He does not see in 3D, but is very active in sports, plays soccer, tennis, etc. Would VT help him to develop 3D and does he need to wear lenses while in VT? What else could be recommended? Well, whenever you have a difference between right eye and left eye, what you want to find out is what's the particular lens powers that balance that. And I started near, and that's where, again, where I use my retinoscope. I, I hold lenses in front and where does, what lenses did it take, does it take to begin to balance that? Um, and 3D, many times uh, they might not have 3D on a 3D test, um, but one of the tests we use has figure ground. Uh, and if you don't have good figure ground, you're not gonna be able to respond to that. So watch what they do. And the fact that he plays soccer um, is something that tells me that, that depth perception is there at a higher level than we might find on our testing. Um, whenever you have 1.5 and 3, that tells me, again, that there's a difference between um, uh, the, the reaching of right eye and left eye. And, and again, I want to balance those. Would VT help? 
um, VT definitely would be something to explore. Um, go to um, somebody who provides VT, get the exam and find out. They will be able to tell you whether or not that will be helpful. But um, you know, my opinion as somebody who has done this for 50 years, is there is always, whenever there are issues and compromises, there's always a benefit to vision therapy. And um, uh, what, what you want is to get your child to the highest level of uh, fun sophisticated function that you can. Okay. Um, a friend wrote in asking just in general, um, about delays in crawling or walking and and why that would be a concern? Um, delays in crawling or walking. One of the things, think about crawling itself and what, what is, is involved there. Um, you, you put one hand and one leg, one hand and one leg, and you develop this sense of balance between right side and left side. Then you coordinate that with the legs and, and as right hand reaches, um, left leg reaches. And, and so you've got this cross pattern kinds of things going. Um, those are all things that are very important to establish uh, down the road um, in terms of more sophisticated movement, running, um, start and stop, the soccer that we were talking about before, being able to change directions, anticipate. Uh, if, if you don't have that established at an early age, um, it, it, it doesn't mean that they can't do those kinds of things, but they're not going to be able to do them as well. It's, then that sets the stage for walking. Walking is an, all, uh, an alternate kind of pattern. Uh, not just with your legs and feet, but throughout your whole body. And, and so think about those kinds of things um, as you look down the road rather than where they are now. Um, I hear parents say, well, he scooted along on his uh, behind and, and everything was okay. That may be true. Uh, and then he got up and started walking and we skipped the crawling stage. What you've got to have is a, a one stage sets the foundation for the next stage and it sets the foundation for the next stage. And when kids go through each of these stages, it's very, very important that they do them um, accurately and they do them time and time again. It's said that you have to practice something a thousand times before it becomes a part of you. So think about that crawling process and think about if they don't go through the alternating process of, of moving, then um, how does that affect them later in life? And it, it has a significant impact in, in terms of the, the intricacy and the finesse which, which they can do them, not can they do them or not. Okay. We have another question here, um, mother of a two and a half year old um, who has intermittent esotropia. She's been recommended occupational therapy to integrate reflexes and she's also been recommended vision therapy and just wondering how the two um, maybe work together or if she can, should consider one or the other. Um, certainly if there's a, uh, a way to work together uh, would would want to do that uh, with the ultra the intermittent uh, esotropia, which means for for those who don't know, sometimes the eyes are straight and sometimes the eye turns. Think about the uh, timelines of when things happen. If that's something that's just recently happened, my guess would be that there's a fairly significant amount of farsightedness there. Uh, because two and a half is when they really start looking at more detail at things up close. And that's when you're going to see it more. You're also going to see it more up close than you see far away. So if that's the case, then, then uh, I would lean towards um, having um, 
vision therapy as a primary tool, one of the first tools there, because there are several ways to go about getting alignment. One could be something as simple as the guidance activities we've talked about. Another may be lenses that we've already talked about, but not lenses to make them see clearer, but lenses to reduce the focusing effect they have. Because I, I tell parents, when, when babies who have a high amount of farsightedness um, show an intermittent eye turn or, or even a full eye turn starting two and a half to three to three and a half, when they look at you with both eyes together, you're not clear. And they find that if they turn one eye or the other, now you're clear. And they look far away and eyes go straight. They look back at you, you're not clear. So they find that way. And then they practice that. And the more they practice that, the more that becomes a part of their thing. But it's not because they of a muscle problem or because they can't, uh, can't necessarily see clear. Well, they, it's because they can't see clear. And they, they learn to do that. Again, it's not a muscle problem. Many times we'll prescribe glasses. Now they look at you and you're clear. And, but if they try their old way of focusing, that overdoes it, and now you become blurry, and so there's reinforcement to come back out and hold eyes straight. Um, th th those are just some very, very basic things that happen around two and a half to three. Uh, but I would certainly involve um, the optometrist to see uh, if those things are involved, uh, regardless of the overall treatment plan. Um, we have another one here. It's, it's a little bit longer, but bear with me here. Um, okay. We have a mother, her almost five-year-old daughter um, was seen by a pediatric ophthalmologist recently and diagnosed with infantile exotropia. Um, the ophthalmologist says that um, she will need surgery, um, wants her to patch the strong eye for one hour per day and come back in two months to be reassessed and make plans for the surgery. Um, and that the surgery um, needs to happen before one year of age. Now, the mother, they also saw an- Wait, wait, Colleen, just a second. Mm -hmm. uh, she was how old? She's five months old. Oh, five months. Okay, I thought you said five years old. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, they also saw an optometrist about a month ago. So when, when the daughter was four months old, the optometrist said because she is alternating focus between the eyes and she's able to bring them into focus, that it may improve over the coming months as she continues to develop. And the mom says this has seemed to happen. Um, she said she's developing normally, otherwise rolling over, reaching for toys, bringing them to her mouth etc. She's been working on things from the book Active Baby Healthy Brain. And she just wants to know, is it okay to still wait this out? Or is there some urgency, like the ophthalmologist said, to kind of have surgery done before one year? Well, there's, there's always an urgency, but maybe my uh, definition of urgency is a little different than somebody else's. Um, I, I would... Um, uh, want to make sure that we are not just waiting to see if that's going to happen, but actively engaged in looking. Um, I, I'm, uh, oh, I'm, uh, the older I get, the more cautious I am about patching, because what patching literally does is disrupt your using both eyes together rather than encouraging both eyes together. If both eye, if she's alternating, both eyes uh, generally are going to have equal visual acuity. Um, so to, to me, should you ever use patching, and I do in specific situations, but not all day long every day, um, it, it's more to get one eye that's not working to working better so you can begin to move on. Um, but I, I, would, um, I, I would certainly say the urgency to do any kind of surgery, particularly if it's improving, um, is not uh, as high on my list now as it would be if it's not improving. Um, I don't want to say that surgery is never necessary, but I want to do everything else possible before we resort to that. 
um, general, uh, you know, things, um, some of the things I'm saying, just general guidance activities seem so simple and they are so simple, but in another way, they are so complex. Just looking and following a target is a much more complex activity than it might seem. Never, never, never discount the simplicity and yet the complexity of guidance activities and movement activities. Okay. All right. We have a mother, um, she's looking for a provider for her baby. And she wants to know how, how should she go about looking for an optometrist who um, maybe she's seen functional developmental optometrist by their name. She's heard of vision therapy. Um, how does she find a decent provider for a baby? Oh, decent's not a good word. <laughs> well, <laughs> appropriate. Um, appropriate, yes. There's, there's two ways to do that. Number, number one, anybody who does vision therapy, a VTOD, those kinds of things, um, generally has a good background and understanding of the process of development. And when you're working with the babies, that process of development is, is, is so foundational. Uh, so that's one, one way. Another way is I was part of development of a program through the American Optometric Association called Infant C. And you can go on the Infant C website, www.infantc.org, find a provider within your zip code or, or that, that's close by, uh, closer by. Uh, close is a relative, always a relative term. Um, but if, if you go to that website, Put in your zip code and you can go anywhere from one mile to 50 miles away uh, and find a provider. Those are people who have uh, um, said, we'll provide to get, make sure the baby is off on the right foot. We'll provide an exam at no charge uh, during that first year of life, up to 12 months of age. Um, if, if other things need to be done, and they don't provide those, they'll coordinate a consult with you outside of the things that they do. But infancy.org uh, is, is a nice place to start. But also, you can look at um, um, any number of other websites, the OEP website, the COVD website, covd.org. Um, those kinds of things um, uh, re are resources where people will... Um, uh, be able to provide early developmental views of your young child. Okay, okay this one is from a provider. Um, I had a 16 month old patient yesterday who is not walking yet. She hasn't learned to crawl and was delayed in learning to sit. I'm not surprised that she has an obvious eye turn. My advice to the parents was to not help the child to walk, but rather to encourage her to crawl, let her spend more time on the floor and engage in playing with her. However, I noticed that her limbs were floppy. Should I refer them to another specialty? I'm to see them back in one month. Um, it, it, this is one that you could very likely coordinate, particularly with a physical therapist, uh, maybe even an occupational therapist, someone who works with kids uh, like that, uh, more engaged. But, but you know, the, these kids that are floppy um, uh, just don't have good muscular control. And, and if they don't, that limits, I mean, you go back to everything that I said earlier in the, in the preamble up to this, is that the, the foundation is not there to, to get up and walk. A lot of tummy time, moving things from right side to left side, but you got to engage vision with these kids. Um, you, you've got to develop core strength. If you don't have core strength, and, and you're not uh, familiar with that or the primitive reflexes. I don't necessarily do primitive reflex uh, therapy, but some people do. If you don't get the whole body engaged, 
then the foundations are not going to be efficient or sufficient for them to do what they need to do. Um, working with those people um, is outside sources, uh, occupational therapy, physical therapy, are always good uh, contacts to refer back and forth. Um, they provide, I'm not going to do occupational therapy kinds of things. I'm not going to do physical therapy kinds of things. So you need to coordinate that with somebody who does well. Now, flip side of that is they're not going to be doing vision things and they need to coordinate those kids like this who, who are, who la do lack a, a, a muscle tone to you because the same kind of thing is going to be in effect throughout the body head to toe. Coordination of effort is, is always in the best interest of the child. Okay, um, another quick question here. Um, we are getting close to time here, so this, this might be our last one, but if, if any of you are out there still with questions, feel, feel free to type it up and send it through. Um, a question, you know, if, if a child, you know, no noticeable vision issues, eye turns, you know, developmental delays or anything along those lines, um, what, when should they see an optometrist? Uh, that that that's an easy question to answer. <laughs> uh, anywhere between six and six months and a year of age. Um, six months is whenever they start at more accurately reaching and begin to respond to some of the depth perceptions um, and depth perception responses to us. Uh, but six months to twelve months of age is is the first time I want to see them. Second time I want to see them is around that two and a half to three time because that's when a different uh, foundation begins to kick in. Then I want to see them prior to entering school. Now I may want to see some of these kids on an annual basis, but but um, it, it depends. We've seen so many kids, 10% of the kids within infancy between that six and 12 months age, 10% of the kids have problems, 10%. And we've seen over, we've had uh, reports to us of over 150,000 kids. So that's 15,000 kids have had problems that supposedly were, um, uh, supposedly were, uh, quote, normal. And um, then we find those kinds of problems. That's, that's after all of the major things have been taken away. Uh, and already been identified and addressed. But still, there's 10% of those kids that have problems. Um, routine care, starting early, is so important. And early is that 6 to 12 months age range. Even if you as a parent don't see any problems. Because many times, the child can be looking with both eyes. But because one eye is so out of focus... They're only looking, you know, they're only using one to look. Um, kids can't tell you, oh, I can't see. And parents don't go walk around covering and uncovering a child's eye to see. Um, it, it's just so important to start early, six to 12 months. And that's even if the pediatrician has said that everything looks okay from their point of view. Yes, because uh, I use medical caregiver rather than pediatrician. But yes, that's what I was uh, trying to uh, intimate whenever I said the medical caregiver has already identified any major and obvious problems. Um, and then the parent brings them into us and we've 10% of the kids outside of that already identified by the medical caregiver have problems mm -hmm. over and above. So yes. It, make it a part, you know, you take your kid to the dentist. Um, we, you take your kid to other kinds of things. Just put that check mark in there to take them to the optometrist too for an exam. Great. Okay, we have a comment here. I find six months is a good age for cooperation. A little later, the tykes are sometimes not as cooperative. <laughs> in, in my lectures, I use the statement, Six months olds are easy. 
a two-year-old is like putting an octopus in a sack. <laughs> You've always got an arm or a leg out of that sack <laughs> somewhere, and you never get it in. Absolutely, they uh, they're, they're so much easier, so much easier to 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 do an exam with. Have fun with them. <laughs> Have fun with them. Great. Okay. So I'm not seeing any other questions from our audience here. If any of you have anything, speak now. Um, but I think otherwise, we're ready to wrap it up. We thank you, Dr. Steele, for your time and all the great information you shared. And like I said, this will be, this has been recorded. The recording will be available on the iHeart VT website. And I'll make sure to post it in the Vision Therapy Parents Unite Facebook group as well. Um, probably on Monday for everyone in case you want to reference it. You're very welcome. I hope everybody uh, has a good weekend as we gradually unravel from this pandemic, we hope. Yeah. Um, and uh, look forward to things getting back to uh, probably a new normal for everybody. Normal, yeah. Hope everybody stays healthy and happy Father's Day for those celebrating Father's Day. And yes. Happy Father's Day to you, Dr. Steele. Thank you. Thank All you. right. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I see Greg back there. <laughs> Bye, Greg. <laughs> Hi, Glenn. Hi, Greg. Bye-bye, <laughs> all. Bye. -bye,